March of 2023 saw the release of the most recent paid DLC expansion for Dead Cells, Return to Castlevania. In what must have been a dream come true for the developers of the game, they got to bring iconic enemies, bosses, locations, and characters from the Castlevania series into their game to create a spectacular crossover event that is a true love letter to the game series that inspired their own work. While the lore of the expansion is different from the previous DLC packs of Dead Cells, having very little, if anything, to do with the lore established in the game, there is still a story there that players get to experience as they play through the newest expansion. So let's take the time and go through the Beheaded's journey through the locales of Castlevania, and see the story of the Return to Castlevania expansion in full. Throughout their various journeys through the realm, the Beheaded had noticed the strange effects of not only time, the result of the Timekeeper constantly resetting the time loop to keep the malaise at bay, but also of space on the realm. Every subsequent journey through its diverse environments was different from the one before, with the cells of the prisoner's quarters, or the platforms of the fractured shrines, or the wreckage of the infested shipwreck, having new physical dimensions where previous rooms and pathways were nowhere to be seen, with new ones taking their place. They had never really put much thought into the phenomenon because they never really had to, since they could always make their way through the environments, no matter how they changed. But then, things got weird. One day, a pedestal appeared in the lobby of the prisoners' quarters with a tome that told of independent legends, heroes from other worlds, and upon the appearance of this pedestal, the beheaded began to find strange rooms in the prisoners' quarters that held the weapons of those heroes, and they could find the costumes of them if they met certain conditions. For example, there was the flask and armor of a penitent one who hailed from a far-off land of deep religious worship the letterman jacket and animal mask of a masked vigilante who used a solid bat to bash in the skulls of his enemies, and a bathrobe of a swordsman named Zero whose prowess in battle was aided by a drug that warped his perception of time. The fact that the rooms that these artifacts were found in seemed directly lifted out of the world they originally came from seemed to suggest that whatever magic or phenomenon that was causing the environments of the realm to change was beginning to affect the space around it as well, blurring the boundaries between worlds. This suspicion was confirmed when, one day, a huge, sprawling, sinister castle appeared, unleashing never-before-seen monsters and huge waves of bats upon the realm. The Beheaded went to investigate, and soon met a vampire hunter named Richter Belmont, who had been transported to the realm along with the castle. Richter explained that deep in a defiled necropolis, a large skeleton that was the physical embodiment of death was holding a ritual that was going to bring about the return of the vampire lord, Dracula. Richter asked for the Beheaded's help in stopping Dracula's return, pointing them in the direction of his castle where they would meet again. As the Beheaded made their way through the castle's outskirts, they came upon a large chamber with a coffin in the center. However, the entity that emerged from the coffin was not Dracula, but his son Alucard, who, now that his self-imposed slumber had been interrupted by the Beheaded, resolved to stop Dracula's return. And just like Richter, Alucard asked for the Beheaded's help in fulfilling the task, promising to meet them in the Vampire Lord's castle. As the Beheaded continued moving through the weeds of the outskirts, they came upon a jail cell that could only be unlocked after they snagged a key from a wily cat that bounced around the area. Inside the cell was another ally of Richter's, Maria Renard, who had set out to stop Dracula herself, but had been imprisoned here by one of his troops. Upon being rescued, she went to go help Richter, but left Biako, her cat, with the Beheaded to help them in their own quest to defeat the Prince of Evil. After passing a large ornate fountain that ominously spewed blood, the Beheaded passed into the oppressive halls of the castle proper, where they came upon several other references of the Belmonts and Alucard's previous adventures against Dracula. There was a large polyhedral object that Alucard used to rest and save his progress. There was a pair of ghostly lovers, dancing away their troubles in a private ballroom of their own. There was a large ballroom mask that had blood pouring from its left eye, the calling sign of the vampiress Carmilla. And there was the huge, grotesque, corpse ball form of Legion, 
chained to the ground to prevent it from rising up and attacking the beheaded. Through all of this, the beheaded noted a conspicuous absence of Richter, who, despite promising to meet them here in the castle, was nowhere to be seen. They continued on, though, and soon made their way to the Master's Keep, but before they could enter, they were bound by necromantic chains that pulled them down to the depths of the defiled necropolis, where death, Dracula's second-in-command, tried to stop them from approaching their master. However, despite the ambush and death's immense strength and power, the beheaded was able to defeat the Reaper. As they made their way out of the necropolis, Alucard arrived and gave them some bad news. Though they had defeated death, the ritual to bring Dracula back had been completed. The vampire lord had returned to his full power. Additionally, due to his innate nature, death too was able to come back, meaning any further attempts to reach Dracula would be continually interrupted by his second-in-command who would stop at nothing to protect his master. They needed a way to circumvent this problem and directly reach Dracula's sanctum so they could meet him face to face. Alucard sent the beheaded on their way, telling them he would reach out when he figured out a plan. It didn't take long for him to figure something out, as upon the beheaded's next run through the realm, they met Alucard in the lobby of the prisoner's quarters, who explained that he found a way to reach Dracula's lair, and the key lay in the clock tower of the realm. Dracula's castle also had a clock tower, and by using this similarity in the blurring between worlds that had been happening recently, the beheaded could make their way back to the castle. And upon meeting Alucard at the clock tower, the prince clarified what would be different about this journey to the castle. The beheaded would be able to bypass death and finally be able to reach Dracula in his keep. The beheaded got ready to dive through the doorway, but before they did so, Alucard warned that now that Dracula had been resurrected, he would be preparing a warm welcome for them in the halls of his castle. Indeed, when the beheaded made their way through the halls again, they were harried by the vampire lord, who would send balls of fire and swarms of bats upon them. He was even capable of flipping the beheaded's perspective of the castle upside down, disorienting them and making it difficult for them to navigate. While making their way through these hazards, along with all the other dangers that were present in the castle, the beheaded found out why they hadn't seen Richter in any of their adventures through the halls. The vampire hunter had been locked in a cage and sealed behind a magic barrier after losing a fight with his sworn enemy. The beheaded freed Richter, much to his thanks, and continued on their way again. Unlike their previous journey through the castle, they found the way to Dracula's keep locked. They backtracked through the castle, trying to find the key that they needed to progress, and that was when they stumbled into the lair of Medusa, one of the fiercest monsters under Dracula's sway. Medusa immediately started a ferocious attack on the beheaded, but thanks to their prowess in battle, they were able to avoid being ripped to shreds by her claws or being turned to stone from her gaze and eventually destroy her. They then found a chest in her lair that, when opened, held the key that unlocked the way to the Master's Keep. And with the way now clear, the beheaded readied themselves for the final fight. Before they entered Dracula's throne room, they came upon Alucard and Richter, and learned that, despite the experience that each of them had in battling the Prince of Evil, neither one of them would be helping the beheaded in the fight that lied ahead. Alucard explaining that he had made a personal choice not to spill familial blood again, and Richter saying that he was still too weak from his fight from earlier. But Alucard pushed them to go on, telling them that it was possible to defeat his father. So the beheaded gathered their courage, crossed the threshold, and met Dracula face to face. After a short conversation, their battle began, and just as Alucard said, the beheaded was able to defeat the Lord of Darkness. However, their fight wasn't over yet, as soon after Dracula's defeat, the chamber began to rumble and shake. Then the floor crumbled beneath the beheaded. As they plummeted towards the ground, a huge demonic monstrosity appeared before them, the final form of Dracula. The Vampire Lord pulled out all the stops in this final fight with his foe, using the full extent of his demonic powers in an attempt to destroy the Beheaded. But it wasn't enough, and soon the Beheaded overcame Dracula's final form 
and destroyed him once and for all. Without his power to sustain it, his castle began to crumble. Alucard and Richter, who were soon joined by the victorious beheaded, watched the devastation from a cliffside close by as the sun rose on a world saved yet again from Dracula's devastation. Thus ending the story of the return to Castlevania DLC for Dead Cells. While the story of the DLC was much more like a mini Castlevania game than an expansion to Dead Cells and its lore, it's still cool to see Dead Cells get a crossover with one of the games that was so influential in its design, and all the allusions and references to the Castlevania series are just as cool to see. Now, I tried to include all the references and easter eggs that I could without being too disruptive to the telling of the story, but I'm sure there is plenty that I missed or overlooked, so if you have any that you'd like to point out, feel free to. Additionally, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that every episode is uploaded to Spotify as well as on YouTube, so feel free to listen over there if that'll be easier for you. But, yep, that'll be it for this one. Until next time, thank you for watching and see you later.